I just got so belly. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's not recording yet, but I'll tell you. What, it, now it's recording. Yeah. We we, we will definitely wait. <laughs> we will wait. All right. All right. Looks like it's sending us to YouTube now. So I'm going to hit record. And as soon as we have Jonna or whoever else might be the first, there we have Bast's Breath. Hello, hello. All right, we have one. Leah, we have that two. Is that a satanic reference? Bast Breath? Is that like Satan's Breath? Who's Bast? I have no idea. I don't know if I know this person and it's just a moniker for the screen name or... If that's their real name, I have no idea. Da Puma is here and it says there's eight people in the room, so we can eight commence. Is, eight, is a magic eight is enough. We can commence the nonsense. <laughs> How you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm flat, but rallying. I feel less flat than I did a few minutes ago. So that's good. Do you have any techniques for unflattening yourself before you go on camera? Um, well, I like, I, I don't feel like, I mean, I occasionally feel flat, um, but I don't, it's not usually like, oh, I just feel flat right before like the show. So I'm doing things to, to sort of get ready for the show or anything like that. Um, but generally just getting into a conversation that's of any interest, we just had a little feather friend, any interest to me, like, per, you know, sort of peps me up. Right. Um, yeah. So I put makeup on. I chatted with you on the phone pre-show. I'm, you know, 20% less flat than I was <laughs> before that. So I'm ready to go. Um, well, your makeup I, looks great. You did a fine job. Thank you. So did you. I think we were doing, I think we were, there was another one. that. <laughs> it's like, there's like these little invisible birds flying around that just let us see one feather or something. I don't you get live it. in a secret hen house, don't you? I do. I live in a secret hen house. <laughs> Right, there's a fox guarding it <laughs> right outside. Um, it's not, oh, not Amaryllis? It's not Amaryllis fox, I was just going to say. <laughs> but um, anywho, okay. So um, let's uh, let's start with Jordan and Brett. And okay. then we'll uh, move on to, we'll have a short skip over the Tulsi, uh, you know, terrain. And then we'll get to uh, RFK and that just absolute clown show. Um Joe. All right. So what you got? Okay. We're starting at 3731. For the folks who are watching us, Jordan Peterson just interviewed Brett Weinstein Steen. Um, I saved Emily the nauseating horrors and I watched it. <laughs> Excellent. Tracking two clips, which I, I realize there's a theme. Like I generally pull like what's the meat of the matter? Like, what is the point of this whole podcast? So we have two clips that in my perspective are actually the point. He's just repeating his same Darian Gap story um, right. that he's been making the rounds with. Just so everybody knows, because they were not privy to our pre-show, um, this show had a different title when it first came out. It was called The Sacred and the Shaman. And today they, it was either today or yesterday, they changed it to the Darien Gap and postmodernism. So I don't know if they decided that they weren't getting enough clicks with the other name or if it was a little too edgy for the Daily Wire, you know, with the term shaman, that's maybe, that's somehow probably anti-Semitic or something like that, <laughs> right? So anywho, um, okay, so where should we, where should we hop in? Okay, we're gonna hop in at 3731. While you're looking for that, did you see Piers um, interview uh, Ben Shapiro. I watched like a uh, Kyle Kolinsky clip today that was showing that where he just refused to say anything. Refused, Re totally yeah. refused. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a lawyer, so I think he doesn't want to get sued, right? Like, I think he he knows the the rules here, and so like he knows damn well that she didn't actually say anything anti-Semitic, and because there aren't the level of anti-Semitism laws on the books yet that they would really like there to be, that they're trying to create that scenario, that if he continues and he makes claims on a huge platform like that, it's going to open him, him up to, um, you know, slander and libel lawsuits and things like that. So I think he's smart enough to not say that and just let his trolls and uh, his minions do it for him. 
Is that the official reason why she was fired for being anti-Semitic? Uh, well, I don't think that's the reason that they've given, right? But I don't think he wants to address any of those claims because if right. you go, he, he's not um, for for how intelligent he supposedly is. He he slips, he makes flubs, and he shows his true colors, right? Oh, yeah. there, um, Kyle Kalinsky had this great, and I can't stand Kyle Kalinsky, um, but he had this great little clip where he was saying, like, back a while ago, apparently. Ann Coulter said something negative about Jews. And while, so Ben Shapiro came out and said, while it was wrong for her to say that she's been a staunch supporter of Israel, so we'll stand by her. So there, they, so th thereby he's, he's admitting that this isn't really about whether someone's anti-Semitic because being anti-Semitic is having some, some, um, something against Jews. It's not having something against Israel. He's not, he doesn't really care about Jewish people. He cares about the state of Israel. Right. So it's OK for Anne, Anne to say something anti-Jewish, but not anti-Israel. And because, you, and because Candace was critical of Israel rather than critical of Jews, that's a problem. I'm just wondering, and I don't know if they've put out a statement, if it was her Israel stance or if it was those last two ridiculous rabbi shows. Because if I was a producer, if I had, you know, uh, a show... I would think those were embarrassing, you know, like the like I could see if we weren't dealing with the whole Israel Jew thing that the stunt she pulled with those two shows being so like kind of gossipy and low vibe could have been enough. But I wonder what well, you have to remember, like she had shows with uh, what's his name, Kanye West and, and whatever. She defended Kanye West and they did, I didn't fire her. No, I actually think it's because she was about to go to Israel and Gaza. Right. And so they couldn't wait till she got back and fire her before she shows them. This was a convenient time. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if they put those people up to attacking Candace, knowing that she would have them on so that then they could fire her. Right. Like the ridiculous. That thing. resonates. That Because yeah. you see Rabbi Shmuley's like. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, but that's exactly it's almost like. If he hadn't hadn't already been enacting the thing you said he was doing, he heard what you said. He's like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to make everybody hate all Jews because this isn't really about Jews. It's about Israel. Right. Or whatever it is. And so, yeah, like that was the craziest thing ever. And like Alex Jones has made like some of the most coherent Twitter posts or it said some of the most coherent things I've ever heard him say in the last couple of days in his analysis of Rabbi Shmuley and this whole situation that's going on. Right. It's been pretty. Anytime you can make Alex Jones look like he has the moral high ground and as coherent as Shmuley made him look. <laughs> We're living in clown world. Totally. Totally. Yep. All right. So now to two of our favorite clowns. Yes, exactly. Right. He does look more and more like the Joker. Look at him. Yes. hundred percent. Right? Yeah. 100%. I mean, Brett keeps inching his way closer to Bozo, but he's becoming the Joker, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can't help it. I have to. No, go ahead. <laughs> All right, 37, 31. Here we go. Oh, we get another commercial. Sorry, guys. Oh, I love the backdrop. You get more fun commercials than I get. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to mute while we skip. There we go. Okay. Should you and I take this free online class for women? We should. <laughs> Why is it? Oh, I put the sound off. Hold on a second. Shit. Let me fix this. You're doing a great job. Not really. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, you are. Let's go back to the question you asked about uh, political orientation and what the values are. And yeah. I've done a lot of thinking thinking about this long before I went to, to Panama to see this. And I've come to the conclusion that we've been sold a bill of goods. No, I don't know why it stopped. And the bill of goods was called multiculturalism. And the problem with multiculturalism is that it sounds like something that those of us who like to interact with people from many different cultures should appreciate. But it's in fact the opposite of the thing that we, the value that we actually hold. The value that we actually hold, I would call Western cosmopolitanism. Yeah, Western that's cosmopolitanism. very different. It's the opposite. 
Mm -hmm. right? Multiculturalism is the idea that people should uh, not join our societies, but they should maintain their own traditions uh, in an isolated pocket and, and that we should effectively reject the idea of becoming one people in the mm -hmm. West. It's just so, a reduplication of the situation that obtains in the world at large with no appreciation for the fact that if you bring people together and reduplicate the situation of the world at large with no uniting meta narrative, let's say, oh, you also. That was that? it. Oh, yeah, no uniting meta narrative. So the solution to the meta crisis will be the meta narrative that will be the underlying like theory of the one world religion. Correct. So you, yeah, okay. you, you found the spot. We're done with this one. But also notice, and I know that the audience is not yet privy to the interview that you and I were talking about before the show, but I interviewed someone who's part of this op concealing project and he kept talking about we need a, a shared field of values. We yes. need a uniting meta shared field of values. So just start to notice how many of these players use you know, that weird back language to the map are all yeah, all using the same language. Men's making, meta crisis, meta narrative, shared field of values. This he just said in 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 less than 30 seconds, he used the word reduplication twice, right? He, like, that was like a weird he one. To, he has to look for the weirdest words to boost. I don't know if it's his self-esteem or to create this illusion of his intellectual superiority. It's, it's a little annoying. He looks sick in that suit. It makes him look completely washed out. It's like, did you eat something that wasn't beef and salt again, buddy? Are you doing okay? It's <laughs> not a good color for him. It's not very summer. Like he needs to be sipping a mint julep and he needs like a straw hat and he needs, he needs to be in a horse that uh, betting on horses. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the next one is one hour no minutes 28 seconds one hour no minutes 28 seconds got it all right now we get to treat into another commercial <clears throat> largely what's happening here you get um ads from england clearly mm -hmm. the family centre it seems like it's not moving what's happening here the grid went down. Something's going on. My computer is now slow. Okay, here we go. There's the... All right, skip. And then, boop. Rationalizing it as the basis of a society. Far better if you are going to operationalize something for society to encode it in a narrative that is memorable and transmissible and resistant to being to being corrupted. Okay. So, motivating, motivating and stabilizing. Um, comprehensible by everyone, regardless of level of abstract intellectual prowess. 100%. Right. So, you know, so, I, it's interesting how it started with these military type words, operationalize, and, and then we moved into this like encode kind of thing, like a programming thing. And then Jordan Peterson is there to sort of take it into like the repeatable religious mantra that you can say right after the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning or something like that, right? That no one will forget and everyone can remember and no matter how dumb they are. Right, or whatever. And they're also making it seem like they haven't had this conversation, I mean, in their underground lairs at least a right. hundred times, but also at ARC. And so it seems like they're kind of like organically brainstorming what the meta narrative needs to be to unite us in this one world government that they're shilling for. That's it's, all I have from this one. It's interesting. I got an email today from like, you know, my parties and stuff like that that I go to. And it's not in Los Angeles, I don't think, but they were saying that like the lineup for ARC just came out right now. Like I used to work for a party here in, in like a group that threw parties here in Austin called ARC Entertainment, ARK, right? And I've told you a little bit about this before and what happened with, with them, but there's like this huge lineup of dance music. I don't know if it's in Europe or where it is, but it's also called ARC ARC. Their thing is ARC, right? Yes. Yes. So this is always happening that there's like something like this and then there's like a, a, a music thing and then there's a crypto thing and there's a da -da -da -da, whatever, right? And they all seem to sort of energize 
each other. And like, while the people at that huge dance party, it's like not the kind I go to, probably 80% of them don't know about these fools, but 20% of them are drinking this Kool-Aid. The people that don't know who they are, they don't understand that they're actually participating in the same thing. They're going to be subsumed into that same meta narrative solution to the meta crisis kind of thing. And they don't understand that it's a religious movement. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so that's it. They're just turning up the dial on this. Yeah. It was interesting to watch Jordan do this with his hands like he was pulling the idea out of the field at the moment that they were talking, as opposed to that he had rehearsed it in front of the mirror before he got on. Of course, it's like, okay, Brett, here are your four adjectives, and then I'm going to come in with these three. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So thank you for doing the, the dirty work of having to sit through this drivel. And um, so the drivel that I sat through, I watched some Tulsi this week because she had an interview come out with Tucker mm -hmm. um, and it felt timely. Like it feels like we're getting, and she had, she was on another one that I haven't had a chance to listen to today with like Mike Huckabee, where he was questioning her about whether she was a Republican or not and blah, blah, blah. So it feels like she's being sent to like, all the places you have to sort of go through. And if you get approval from these audiences in the interview with Tucker, I'm not going to play any clips, but in the interview with Tucker, in the very beginning, when he's doing his monologue, he goes on and on and on about how she was the most popular person at CPAC. Right. It's pretty clear to me that this interview occurred between CPAC and before the 917 constitution Mar-a-Lago dinner. Right. Okay. It's, it's again, there's some adjustments in language Right. She left. She didn't say Democratic Republic. She did say our democracy and she did yes. say our constitutional republic. So it's like you could tell she's been a tent like she has a tutor or something like that. Or she has like a constitution coach or something who who is helping her sort of um, have her her evolutionary arc to um, the place that they're trying to land her. Um, but I would say that she felt very natural in this. It was a little bit different than some of the other recent interviews where it felt like Tulsi reading her program script, right? Like she she really, she had a much more relaxed feel here, which tells me that she's very comfortable with Tucker, which tells me that they have a long relationship. You know what I mean? So he- I even, feel like they talked about it in that, cause I watched the interviews. I think they talked about their friendship. Like, were you at that thing? The house, like, were you at my house here or there yes, or whatever? Yes. It's like, no, I wouldn't go there. You lived in the ghetto or whatever it is. So, right. um, you know, even when she was, quote, on the other side, she was not really on. There is no other side. There is just the blob. Right. And they're both part of it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, but, but but I would say that, like, she felt the least sort of like rehearsed and she didn't have the helmet hair on. You know what I mean? She just felt kind of natural and at ease. And like she says a lot of things that make sense. Right. She sure she does. And if you haven't all of these people that you and I are on like flies on shit, say more things that we agree with than that we disagree with. And if a person's just listening to them once, a lot of it sounds good. But, you know, if you have the penchant for like analyzing every little, you know, thing that like we do, you find that the way that they are sort of cultivating and curating their arc of discovery is suspicious. Right. Um, and speaking of suspicious arcs of discovery, do you have something to say before we go on to the next one? Well, I was just going to say what it more solidified for me is Tucker's role in all this. Like Tucker's feeling more controlled now to me than when he was on Fox. And all these interviews, he's clearly like softball, like setting up the answers that he's wanting to hear like this one felt very scripted from like i i there was nothing tulsi said that i'm recalling that seemed outrageous like it just right. for me was like tucker has stepped into a more obvious shill role from my perspective than when he was on fox and we were like is he or isn't he I, so i would say I, I don't know that I'd put it like that, right? Like, I don't, to me, it didn't feel scripted. It felt only scripted in that this is what they were always planning to do. So it's a script they know well. They didn't have to, like, memorize it anymore or anything like that. Um, I think he's been uh, cast in the role of the great synthesizer, which right. may or may not be his actual original natural position. Right. So 
before you synthesize, you have to thesis antithesis. Yes. And so if you have like a sort of um, globalist blob and you have people that need to be convinced that like who don't want globalist, they need to be convinced that there's someone who will fight for not globalist. You have to have an anti-globalist lunatic played on television who then, you know, can do the, the synthesis to this place where like he satisfies enough of everyone's needs that everyone forgets that they were trying to avoid the blob. Right. Yeah. So I think he's playing the role of the great synthesizer and, and, you know, Sometimes you cast someone in a role either because they're just a great actor or because you have done enough looking at this person that you sense that they are going to have some uh, evolution in their position on things. And so some of this is going to be natural. And so they're a really good person to serve the purpose. And so then all you have to do is situate things so they end up being that person at that time. And it's much more convincing when it feels like, okay, somebody did go, I mean, you can go back and trace the steps of how Tucker changed his positions on things. It's not like he's just saying he did. You can go right. back to when Jimmy Dore was on his show yelling at him about why he should support Julian Assange instead of think Julian Assange is a traitor. And then Tucker began to look into things and have various conversations with different people. And eventually he changed his position and he still credits Jimmy. That, that was a real thing that happened. Right. And so it's not like he's just saying, I used to think this and I changed my mind, but there was no evidence trail. Right. right. And so I don't know if this is just, you know, when when they're when central casting is picking people to play these roles that aren't your traditional actor roles, they're a little different. Like they just are really good at it and they have a great sense or whether we're looking at looking glass technology where they could already see what was going to happen in the future. And so they just have to put the stones in the right order. I think it's choice B and it reminds me of our interview with Mickey where he was talking about like the evolutionary story is right. so much more cinematic and Correct. that's what we're witnessing with Tucker. I just want to roll back what I said um, about the Tulsi interview. The rel the hardcore religious shit at the end is gross to me. I don't like that that's happening. So I just I just wanted to like set the record straight because I'm like, there was nothing in that interview that- What that happened? Was what was the hardcore religious part? Why does this- They were both doubling down on like how Democrats take issue with the fact that Republicans- that God exists and stuff like- come with God and it's like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah I heard that. playing that card really hardcore and it feels right. like, but there is to be a separation of church and state and right. that seems to be getting fuzzy um sure. well because they're 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 part of bringing in the christian right and the handmaid's tale and all that kind of stuff right. if it was really about people not thinking they're god they would just say they, they could refer to it as or authority for people who are prefer that or they, they could you know there's ways you can say things so like when i'm talking to someone who i know is much more of a believer than me i can say like this is what it is for me for you you might call it that and then it feels like i've acknowledged their reality yeah. Um, and you know, so yeah, I, I, I recall now what you're talking about. So, okay. Anything else on Tulsi? No. All right. So, um, the, the main act at the clown show this week was RFK announcing his vice president, which turned out to be the person that the hints were dropped about last week. Right. So whatever, um, pushback they got when they trial ballooned, it was not enough for them to shift course and they had time to shift course if they wanted to, but they didn't. Um, and, uh, she did give a speech that I, I listened to a few minutes of it on the Kim Iverson show, but I just, it was too boring. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, and you know, lots of people are freaking out for lots of different reasons and, and each person has their reason why they're upset with it. Most people are upset with it, uh, because of the fact that she's such a big donor to his campaign. Right. And the fact that she, or that she has no political experience or, anything like that. She's not, uh, try, hasn't been tested under the, under the gun of the, the, the media or whatever. And those are all reasonable things to think, but like, and then there's other people who have figured out like the Whitney Webb tweet, right. But they, they don't have the background context as to why and how important that actually is. Yep. Right. And so I have gone to, it doesn't, it's not hard, but you just have to know what you're looking for to yep. dig out a little bit more. Thank all you right. for your effort. Yes, it's you know I do what I can. Um, all right, so uh, we 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 looked at this Whitney Webb, um, this Whitney Webb 
tweet the other day, right? We looked at this, right? The director of Shanahan's foundation is simultaneously a part of Open Philanthropy, which financed Event 201, a pandemic simulation RFK Jr. has routinely criticized and is mainly funded by Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskowitz, right? So first of all, we should remember, Dustin Moskowitz's girlfriend's name is Carrie Tuna. The head of his uh, his his uh, foundation is named Chloe Cockburn. Like, I think we're being punked. Yes, I think so. Carrie Tuna and Chloe Cockburn. And yeah. then we have Nicole Shenanigan. <laughs> <laughs> right? So the I no one no one can say the fucktards don't have a sense of humor and they're putting it right out there for everybody, right? So yeah. somebody, uh, this artist brutal had figured out that Chloe Cockburn leads the open philanthropy project. And so Nicole Shanahan's foundation is bio, bio echo. And she chose a person who was the director of another foundation, which is the Open Philanthropy Project. So, um, but, we- but no one on RFK's team would clue into the fact that this is a giant, if not a conflict of interest, at least a conflict of morality or agenda. Like, is is it or is evidence or, or evidence that he didn't actually do all the research for his book? Because if he's that good of a researcher, this took me like. 37 seconds and and I found more stuff right that I haven't seen anyone else come up with right uh, it's not hard no. um so okay so so yes so we have Nicole Shannon against Chloe Cockburn um and then um I went looking I, I was like well I want to see if there's any connection between RFK and Dustin Moskovitz right Ooh. so I found from Chief Nerd on July 29th 2023 New investigation finds Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskovitz is funding a campaign to ban RFK Jr. from the ballot. Over the weekend, Democrats across the country received a text message begging them to sign a petition to ban Robert F. Kennedy Jr. from the ballot. The group behind the campaign is the Progressive Turnout Project a political action committee we discovered that the single single largest donation to came from Dustin Moskowitz, right? Moskowitz is most famous for co-founding Facebook alongside Mark Zuckerberg in 2004. So I see that this links to a an article by someone named Liam Sturgis. I, didn't okay. remember, I don't recall seeing this when it came out. So it didn't actually link to it. So I went and found it. And this Substack page is called the Kennedy Beacon. So is this a Substack page that Kennedy pays for, or is this someone who's just on their own shilling for him or whatever the fuck is going on, right? But yeah. okay, so July 27, 2023, same article here, who's behind ban- the ban RFK Jr., right? And it repeats the same thing I just read, so I'm not going to repeat that, but this article is really interesting, so I am going to read some of the article. But right. wait, don't we find that text odd? Friend, I'm begging Right, friend, I'm begging. Can you sign the petition? Right, it's it's odd. It is odd, but it's not. But let's let's continue, okay? Because yeah, yeah. Liam dug out some things that you know, before only David and I seem to have kind of dug out. Right? right, grassroots campaigns like this are not new. However, the attempt to prevent the American people from having the choice to vote for their preferred candidate is. This continues an unprecedented string of attacks on Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and the First Amendment itself. Remember, this was back last summer, but when he was still running in the Democratic Party. Okay. The group behind the campaign is the Progressive Turnout Project, a political action committee that has been described as the largest voter contact organization in the country. It has a series of sub-organizations operating under different names, two of which are also engaged in the Ban RFK petition, Stop Republicans and Progressive Takeover. We at the Kennedy Beacon were curious as to why this pro-Democrat PAC would be pushing for RFK's removal from the ballot. So we followed the money. Using the most recently recent publicly available data from Open Secrets, we discovered that the single largest donation to the PTP came from Dustin Moskowitz, right? So on my birthday in 2022, on my birthday, uh, he, he donated $145,000 to banning RFK from the ballot. All right, Moskowitz, is most famous for founding Facebook alongside Zuckerberg. Facebook is co-defendant in a lawsuit brought by Kennedy's children's defense and other plaintiffs censored by the platform in collusion with Biden administration. So he's suing Facebook, founded and funded by 
Zuckerberg and Moskowitz. Yep. Right. And Moskowitz is donating to to campaigns, to foundations, which I think we'll find probably are also funded by his 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 other his his umbrella foundation in order to keep Kennedy off the ballot. But he's okay with picking this person's partner, this person who, right? Like this is weird. This is this is really weird. Musk Moskowitz also founded a project management application called Asana in 2008. David and I talk about this in the show and I did dig up that show. So I will link to that. That video is available on Rumble because at the time and maybe still now it would not be permitted on YouTube. So I'll link to it so you guys can go watch this. And it was two years ago, more than two years ago that David and I did that, right? Facebook does, is a does everyone know that we're talking about David Martin? David I just Martin. Okay. David Martin of the Say His Name campaign against <laughs> Dustin Moskowitz, right. right? I have reached out to David uh, to try and see if we can catch up. I have not heard back from him yet. I will keep you posted. Yeah. Moskowitz is most famous. Okay, but Moskowitz also co-founded the Asana in 2008. Between these two massively profitable companies, Moskowitz generated so much wealth that he was identified by Forbes in 2011 as the world's youngest self-made billionaire, even beating out Zuckerberg. After earning, because, you know, like if I were a billionaire, I'd spend all day trying to get people off of ballots. Like that's right. Like it's like that. It's just bizarre to me. Right. After earning his fortune in big well, tech. I mean, it would put uh, we understand why, because Moscovitz would probably go to prison. He's implicated. Well, yes, 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 yes. OK. Right. After like he's trying to save his own ass, but it's odd. Like what an odd abuse of power. Right. After earning his fortune in big tech, Moskowitz and his future wife, the aforementioned Carrie Tuna, signed on to the giving pledge commitment to give away the vast majority of their money before the end of their lives. The giving pledge was a creation of mega millionaires, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, with co-signatories including Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, George Lucas, David Rockefeller and Sam Bankman Freed founder of the recently collapsed FTX. So these people all are signed on a pledge together. What else have they signed together? What other pacts do these people who were supposed to believe some of them are on different sides? Um, th they have a pact, a pledge together. But also, I just want to make sure that people understand that that's a total scam. Like all this philanthropy only yes. goes into their own philanthrop philanthropic organizations. Correct. And ends up making them more money. Like that is a giant freaking scam. Correct. That that's that's for sure. But also, these people have pledges and pacts with each other, and right. they pretend that they oppose each other on the world stage. Right. Okay. To accomplish their goal, Moskowitz and Tuna embraced a philosophy of effective altruism, our favorite. According to its proponents, effective altruists seek to direct funding towards the people and organizations most likely to accomplish a given intended outcome a given intended outcome for the betterment of humanity and the planet, often focusing on topics such as artificial intelligence, natural disasters, and combating misinformation and disinformation. Jesus. Okay? With effective altruism as their anchor, Moskowitz and Tuna started the Good Ventures Foundation in 2011. By the way, there used to be a party throwing company called Go Ventures, right? So we have Good Ventures and Go Ventures. So once again, we have some connective tissue. The yep. focus of their philanthropy was to include biomedical research, pandemics and bioterrorism, education, food security, foreign aid, geoengineering, global health and development, immigration, nanotechnology, and treatment of animals, right? 2001. 2011. A fortuitous, or 2011. Good Ventures also partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to co-fund research related to infectious diseases in Africa. In August 2014, Good Ventures partnered with a similar organization, so many partnerships, so many packs, so many pledges, yep. Give Well to launch the Open Philanthropy Project, which would recommend grants for Good Ventures to fulfill. So you have to start a foundation to tell your other foundation what to do because Correct. we're creating layers, barriers of, you know, to hide behind. All does, of this, does all Soros of this paid for by so so open philanthropy will tell Good Venture. So Damaskowitz starts open philanthropy to tell his other company what to who to grant things to, and he'll pay for those grants. Right. Does does Soros have anything to do with open philanthropy? I, I check. I mean, I, go I, I start typing while I continue reading. Okay. Okay. In the years leading up to COVID nineteen, Moskowitz used open philanthropy and good ventures to provide significant funding toward pandemic preparedness and biosecurity. 
Open Wait, what was the date? What was the date? There's no date. Years leading up to. Oh, shocking. Years leading up to, yeah. Open Philanthropy is also listed as the primary sponsor of a series of tabletop top pandemic war games during which world leaders practice how they might respond to various scenarios involving outbreaks of novel viruses, whether man-made or of natural origin. Some examples include Claydex, May 2018, a spreading plague, February 2019, and of course, the fam infamous Event 201, 2019. Open Philanthropy also funded an exercise in March 2021 that was eerily accurate in its predictions of the upcoming outbreak of monkeypox, which appeared right on schedule a year later. Mm -hmm. Each of these pandemic war games led to a set of recommendations, all of which em emphasized the need to merge the public and private sectors in order to reduce regulatory barriers combat misinformation, and minimize accountability. Kennedy provides a comprehensive summary of these war games in his book, The Real Anthony Fauci. As COVID-19 crisis emerged, open philanthropy began providing millions of dollars to help shape America's institutional response. In March 2020, they provided a $250,000 grant to a think tank called Center for Global Development to support work developing COVID-19 response guidelines and decision support tools to disseminate to local leaders, which were intended to help local leaders take appropriate measures to limit the spread of the virus. They provided, they provided further funding for projects involving like a bunch of long haul COVID, COVID-19 testing, coverage of COVID-19 in the media, lockdown policies, bioethics, and Pfizer's, Pfizer's experimental drug, drug Paxlovid. All areas where RFK Jr. argues that the Trump and Biden administration completely failed Americans if they were even necessary to begin with. OK, mm -hmm. so and they go here, they go to, um, you know, acknowledging the fact that uh, Savvy Sabs um, pointed out that, you know, um, the co-founder of Facebook was involved in this attempt to suppress the campaign. We don't need to read any more of this. Right. So the Kennedy Beacon reached out to Moskowitz for comment and there was no response. So this was back in July. Right. That he oh, went in. Toss something else in. They gave thirty-eight million to John Hopkins Center for Health Security. Yep, I think that's on that. Yeah, and seventeen and a half to Sherlock Biosciences, Sciences, which I think I've heard David Martin talk about. That's what's in that. So th that was what we got into in the show that we um, that that I that I'm gonna I'm gonna link when we're done here, right? To yep. that. so okay. So back in July of 2023, Liam Sturgis is um, was able to dig out all of these kind of connections, you know, a bit after David, David and I had dug them out. Like David knew it. I went and dug it, brought it back to him and was like, is this what you mean? And he was like, yes, he had not sort of put all that little, right. He, he has his own way of saying it. I said it in a more blatant way. Um, okay. So I just want to see if this Liam Sturge, I want to see if this Kennedy beacon has anything, to what they're saying today. Kennedy, like, let's see. Kennedy names Shanahan. Let's see if these people are okay with this. It was, it's, we're not looking at, Lee, at Liam Sturgis anymore. Now we have a Leah Watson. Uh, it seems like they're supportive of this. What? Yep. After, wait, that makes no sense. Was he bought? Right. Was he threatened? Well, it's, Liam Sturgis is not here anymore. Oh, so, it's not. What I think is this is a sub stack that was paid for by uh, maybe that super PAC that's supporting Kennedy. And they will hire journalists that, um, you know, write articles that are convenient to them at that time. But it's funny to me that they didn't look back in their archive. Right. At least pull the other one down. OK, so here we have whatever the fuck this is, we have. The person running the campaign is a CIA agent. <laughs> right? Yeah. We have his foreign policy advisor being Shmuley, who, you know, whatever you- is that official or is that just like, I thought that was like his spiritual advisor. Whatever it is, that, that, se that seems to be the right. same thing for him because he's, you know, completely dedicated to Zionism and the support of the state of Israel and whatever it is, right? Correct. So we have um, the team is uh, Amaryllis Fox, Rabbi Shmuley, and Nicole Shenanigan, best friend of Chloe Cockburn and Carrie. T you know, this is like, are you serious people? So 
But well, don't forget Dell and Charles Eisenstein. <laughs> correct. And Mickey makes the films. Correct. <laughs> it's an all-star cast. Okay. So this is so clown show, right? Like, so we're expected to believe that a person who could put as many footnotes in his book about Anthony Fauci could not do the, th I'm going to tell you the truth of how long it took me to find this, 37 seconds, right? Could not do 37 seconds, or, couldn't even cover their own tracks and on their own fucking version of Bezos blog, uh, delete the article that exposes the fact that they already understand what's going on here. That's why I feel like he's trying to blow it on purpose at this point. But even if, like, let's take this connection aside um, with the event 201 and the Dustin Moskovitz, just the fact that he only, that he would choose an elite a rich billionaire with zero political background is already cringy enough on top of this, which is appalling and should be a total deal breaker if he wasn't a complete fraud. Okay. So here's the, so Kim, I was listening to Kim Iverson last night who almost- What was her take on it? Well, she was so annoyed. She almost couldn't form a complete sentence, right? <laughs> And like, it was like, one of the things that I've noticed is like every once in a while, she has a show where she like, doesn't sound well spoken, but it's because she's so Twitter painted emotionally. It isn't because she's not well spoken. Like some of the stuff she's just able to be totally smooth and professional about, but you can tell she's still mad she got tricked by this at the beginning because she was into this at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So for her, it's mostly that like her biggest problem is with this person is the same problem that like you and I have with like Malone and Brett and whatever. It's like, why is someone like, okay, so, so the claim here is sort of that Nicole Shanahan woke up sometime in the last year, right? This is what Nicole Shanahan said in her speech was that she was brainwashed into thinking that Bobby Kennedy was a lunatic. But last year, one of her best friends begged, begged again, there's that word begged, they're beggars and pleaded with her to please just listen to one podcast where RFK was. And then she couldn't stop. And she was listening and listening and listening. And, you know, she's been won over by him. And so now this is her political move. Right. OK, so it's the same thing that we're talking about. Someone who let, she's claiming she woke up when she listened to Bobby Kennedy. So that and that that happened within the last year. So Kim's complaint, which is a reasonable one, because we've made the same complaint. And if we've made it, it's got to be reasonable. <laughs> We're the most right. reasonable people on. Totally. OK, <laughs> so, her, so she's upset that a person who she's like, even if this person is totally honest and genuine, that she is just waking up in the last year is a problem. She's not been tested. Right. So when they kind of think and she has no political experience. There, I'll go. I'll go one better than that. That's all true, but there's one way in which waking up last year and all of this could have played out in a way that I've been like would be like, all right. Well, I still don't think I believe you, but at least this is a stronger move. When I realized that someone who was funding some projects that I was also partnered with had paid to keep this man off the ballot, I decided I had would I have to go see right? What is so dangerous that we have to keep it off the ballot? And when I heard what he was talking about, and I was like, well, why would they want to keep the American people from knowing this? And I started to do my research and I was appalled by what I found. And I withdrew all of my investments in the companies that these people are, all that kind of shit, right? Like if they had played that card, which they never would, because it's a clown show, I still wouldn't have believed them. But that would have been the story to go with if you're trying to tell a wake up story that is so convincing that this person who was an insider is now the furthest outsider. That's the one they would have told. Correct. But you that would be if RFK respected us. He thinks we're fucking morons because look at his revisionist stories around Israel. He's just banking on the fact that no one's going to figure this out because he thinks that we're all idiot idiot plebs well either that or whoever his handlers are right they love the mockery show they picked schmooly right they put they told him to wear the outfit with the rubber nose and all of that kind of stuff he right didn't need it. he already looks like that right? but this is, there's like they love this shit because you know people there's people defending this like i listened to like some 
earnest sounding kid with 145 subscribers on YouTube explain, you know, like how much he believes in Bobby and how much he trusts Bobby. And now that he's made these decisions and picked her and they're right, that his, 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 his charge is going to be to not fall for the stuff that ever, like there's people out there that still really believe this shit. And there's something, I don't know what it is that loves what, like mocking people that way and like watching people lap, lap it up. And whether that, you know, whether those are the same people that like, have Bobby by the balls or are writing his check. I don't know which one it is or if it's the same fucking thing, right? Um, they love this shit. They think this shit is hilarious. And they I love- cannot... Oh, go ahead. And they love that you and I turn it up and still no one will do it. <laughs> right, because uh, our 200 listeners, like uh, we love you guys the mostest, but we're not moving the needles. <laughs> right, but it is, but I will have to say, I was talking to Jeff yesterday and Jeff was like, I love, she's like, he's like, you and Danny talk about stuff that like, I just don't care about. I think it's chicken feed. I'm like, well, me too. I don't care about it. It's total chicken feed. He's like, but it's hilarious to watch you guys work your own like meme magic or your own like word witchcraft and like force these sort of ridiculous things to happen. Now, I don't know. Sometimes I jokingly say we're making them do this. Right. But it's happening at such a rapid pace right now that like whether they know we exist or not, whatever sort of algorithm we're throwing into the system is causing some kind of reaction on an almost immediate basis. And it is, it, it's hilarious. So he, Jeff is so amused by, by this. It's, you know, he finds this hilarious. So keep on because we all exist to entertain Jeff. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's, I mean, just if, if Jeff is tuning into stuff he doesn't give a shit, shit about, I'm honored. <laughs> I cannot wait for the Aubrey Marcus show where he explains to us why this is all a-okay. Oh, like, I wonder if he'll have her on and he'll talk to her about, like, er the erotic nature of government. <laughs> yes. And propose that, like, we should, like, on the night, the day that you're sworn in, we should, like, have an orgy and, like, like celebrate. <laughs> an ayahuasca orgy. And, and, and <laughs> has there been any, have any of the health freedom people offered any uh, commentary on this choice of his? Well, What's weird is like, there's a lot less RFK stuff coming through my feeds now than there was for a while. Yeah. But at the same time, like, it seems to get reported that more normie people are into RFK now. So like, it's fucking weird. Like he, his percentages haven't dropped. I don't know if they've just switched people or if that's bullshit. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really care. Um, but- Do you uh, know that polls were created by Tavistock? The concept of a poll is a Tavistock creation. I'm 100% certain it is. Yeah, the Gallup poll was created. Like, they're all fucking fake. Yeah, I'm, I'm certain it is. Um, well, the, the health freedom movement and the Bobby campaign are both mind controlled by Del Bigtree and his handlers. It's interesting. He's a Hollywood person. Remember, he used to be a producer on that show. Yeah. Right? So this has been a production, like, all along, right? Like, his wife is on that. What was that show? Curb Your Enthusiasm? Like we could just be in a satire of that, like one of those kinds of things. And it just involves like all the people, not just the seven actors on the show. Pretty right? much. Um, so, yeah. So I, I don't know. Like I, I, it's, there's very little information about this on like the high wire website. I remember I went looking once just to see, right. It's like, he's trying to sort of part that. Have you, I, did you see when um, I think he was on with uh, Kim Iverson like a week or two ago, Del Big Tree. Mm -mm. Yeah. And he just kind of evaded any sort of important questions and, and, and whatnot. Uh, I don't, I didn't see anything about, you know, the Israel, Israel stuff or whatever it is. And um, he kind of skirted over the like, oh, it's okay for us to work with people we disagree with. And, you know, it's fine to have people whose policies oppose what our policies supposedly are. It's just, you know, like um, it's the show of goodwill to open conversation. Like he didn't say those exact words, but that was the t the tone, right? So yeah, I don't know. But, but um, what they're not addressing is that it renders him a hypocrite. When he says, I support Israel unconditionally with their forced injection policy, it right. negates his entire body of work. It negates the whole reason that he's been given relevance and validity with this community. But, like it, but, but on some level, let's just look at this for a second, okay? If, if, if it's, if I haven't done the full forensic accounting, 
But if we could trace back and figure out, right, that the Dustin Moskovitz money has touched his operations, right, then that almost makes him, like, you know how they talk about the the live exercise like to event 201 was like an enclosed thing but like sometimes the exercise involves the people's response to the propaganda right and we could still be in that exercise remember there's that thing where uh the trump is saying in the press con like he's on, in the press conference and he says to like pompeo or millie or whoever the fuck the person was why didn't you tell me we're in an exercise you remember that right like this could be part of the exercise, and this is completely. I mean, the Ooh, that's the, the bank. The, the bankers fund both sides of the war, so we could. I always do this whole thing could be an extended event two hundred one. That's Preparing. part. Of, did you ever like look at because you and I weren't in contact during this period of time? But did you ever look at like Sophia's research on um, capstone exercises? No. Okay, like that is part of it. Right. That the part of it's not just the event at the location where like the exercise supposedly is taking place. Like you the, it's like the it's the same as the fourth wall. Like the the there's a there's no fourth wall anymore. And the audience's response to the play is part of the uh, to the exercise, is part of the exercise. Correct. Right? Um, if you go back and look at her work on the school that shall not be named. Right. She talks about that. And then there was like a full school? the school that shall not be named because we're on YouTube. I'll tell you later. Everyone else knows what I'm talking about. OK. OK. It's a girl's name and it's like Captain from Pe Peter Pan. Got it. OK. Yeah. OK. Um. So and that's all been removed. You'll have to find it other places. Isn't it crazy how there's this like we can't even say the name of that fucking insanity. But you know who you know who apparently you can say the name of because we did in our last episode in the video still up Dustin Moskovitz right and David Martin re requested that everyone say his name right Correct. so and we're gonna distance to saying how he's so like kept in the dark I'm gonna reach out to David and pretend like we didn't have this conversation and just <laughs> <laughs> yeah do like I really want to hear what he has to say about this. Yeah. Right. Like, I'm very curious. And like, I, I understand it's always been part of his profile to like to, you know, speak or work wherever he's requested, whether he agrees with the people or not. So I, I understand that. Like, I don't necessarily like, I sometimes don't understand. I understand that intellectually. I sometimes don't understand how it's hard. It would be hard for me to sort of do that. But I get that. And I cannot have a judgment about it to have a conversation with him. But it seems like a good time for everybody to say his name, Dustin Moskowitz. I feel like I'm in Fight Club. Say it right. <laughs> it seems like the most appropriate time. Like, I would think he would be doubling down on it about now. Correct. Or just wondering what's going on and imploring all of us to look. So I don't know. Like, maybe he's working on it, right? But it would shatter everything. Like, look at the group, the community that has embraced him over the past four years and really pushed him to the forefront. For him to do that and stay consistent with his Moskovitz would, and we spoke about this on our Sunday show, like he could alienate all of them. Correct. He could lose he everything. Could, he could be consistent. Like, like, he's never been super pro RFK. I've never heard him talk about it. Right. But if he were to come out and say something about this, then a, a community that he's been able to peacefully coexist with RFK, and even if he kind of actually opposes a lot of things he does, maybe it would become problematic. I don't know. We'll see. Let's 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 let him say let's let him tell us like what his position is here. So I think what's really most important for you and me is to start our product line with the tagline. We told you so. <laughs> right it's like that shirt uh, if, if i told you so was a person and it has ron paul on the on the, the shirt okay so um i told you guys the other day that i would go dig out i'd forgotten that i put it on rumble that i would go dig out the interview that i did with david martin um and it was it was a while it was a while back um i'm gonna put this in the youtube chat room so everyone can go check it out and i will also put it in the um, in the description after we post the show. Um, but this was my, oh, what is happening here? My, what is happening? I just lost my chat room and it started a tennis video. Something is funny with my computer. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, it was a while back. Whoa, um, all right, what's going on? Let's put it here, chat. 
something is funny with my computer. Okay, there we go. All right. Mercury's prepping to go retro again. All right. So there is my episode with David Martin, in which we did some forensic digging into Mr. Bo Moskowitz. The episode uh, was recorded, um, thanks to Laura's note taking, uh, 10 1 21. So two and a half years ago. Okay. So two and a half years ago. Um, he named the person that is the, this person that seems to be sort of, you know, key in this. We, he didn't name Nicole shenanigan. Um, but, you know, maybe all of these connections are explainable by someone. But if they were, then someone should be explaining. Right. And 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 I just they, they must really think people are dumb. Right. Um, or he must be under some sort of pressure that is like beyond something that we can understand. Right. It might, it might just be straight up mind control where they're straight. legit running him. Totally. And he's not even there. Straight up mind control or straight up, um, you know, uh, Mossad videotape, Brownstone, Epstein list kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Like, we, I don't know. I don't know. But whatever it is that there there's the string of, there's the uh the line the string of uh you know the the people and the money or whatever it is and there's some really interesting things that david and i get into in that that episode i think that was probably my best conversation with him so guys go take a look share it around say his name um right if, if for no other reason it would be amusing to hear somebody try to explain this one away yeah um <laughs> right. Okay. Let's go to the uh, the chat room and see what people have got to say here. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. Tulsi is a witch in someone's opinion. Okay. If you guys have questions, comments, all capital letters, please, because it's easier for me to pull those out. And if not, I'm just gonna um, I'm just going to look at what people have said here. Tucker on Rogan. I heard, I listened to some video of Tucker the other day where he said that he had been in Texas twice this week. So, you know, maybe, but yeah, I think it has to be coming because I did hear someone say that Joe Rogan said he'd been hanging out with Tucker Carlson. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. Tulsi's hair frightens people. Got it. Um, let's see. It's hard for me to read that. Thanks for clicking the thumbs up, guys. You posted something? Oh, oh you're sweet. Dr. Laura's Laura. proud of you. Oh. We have some foreplay happening in the chat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Corinne okay. said Playdex took place 666 days before event 201. And Jana said, of course it did, right? All right, let's see what we got. The poly poly polygamous nature of the government. We know Aubrey. Yep, yep. All right. Hi, Chris Miner. Yep, there was exercises going on the day of 9-11, right? There's always the exercise happening at the time the thing happens, right? So High Heart Wellness watched a video highlighting Shan Shanahan, and within the first minute, she refers to the new generation as technologists and said technology and tech communications are the solution for their generation. All right. You that kind of leads into the show that we're going to do soon about the futurists. Yes. If you think that's off, try reading my other paradigm spellings like Tavistockians. I call them Tavistockians. Um, say his name. Say his name. That's right. That's going to be the, the, the title of this episode. <clears throat> Where did the non-Jews come from? Um, can, I, can I get a little? Uh, I, 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 can you give me a little more? than that to work with. I think I know who that is, but I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to there. Um, I someone... feel like we should all be like, really be blasting the Dustin Moskowitz all over all of our socials for the next few days. Bla blast, blast, you can blast this episode, but also that closing the loop one there, right? Like that was really good because David is there with me looking at the things, me putting it together as to what would be the purpose of him funding all of this. It'd be smart to clip whatever pieces you have of of just David Martin saying those things about Dustin Moskovitz and just be putting that clip out. So I, I can't recall exactly because it was two and a half years ago, but there was a lot of me saying what I think and him saying yes or no as opposed to like him saying it himself. 
I know um, he did a Dustin Moskovitz show. So he's done one show on Dustin Moskovitz and he also has spoken in some of his live, um, you know, conferences and things like that about him. He did like a presentation showing how all the dots are connected. It would be interesting to pull up that map that he made and see if any of the Carrie Tuna, Coley Cockburn or Nicole Shenanigan show up on, on that in any way. Yeah, that would be worthwhile. Um, but uh, yeah, so say his name, share the videos and and like, let's just see, let's force, it would be great to force some kind of response just for more entertainment, for more fodder for comedy, right? But like, what if we don't force it, but what if we just like gently invite him onto our show to talk about this? No, no, I don't mean from him. Yeah, gently invite David on. Force right. RFK's campaign or the people, a health freedom movement or the people who still defend RFK to explain that one away so we can laugh. That's all. I'm just saying fodder for yeah. comedy. No, I, I, I would like to have a respectful intellectual conversation with David about this. Yeah. Right? Um, because we are, we're, we're saying his name. All right. Where is everyone from and why are we different? I.e. another Mandala world. Okay. So, so I think the question being asked, because I think I know who this person is and I, I think I understand like how she sort of sees things, right? Is if people who are not Jewish are different, like on a, on a more meta level than, than Jewish people, where did they come from? Like, where is it? Did we come from different worlds? Do we originate from someplace totally different Jews and non-Jews other than just the geographic locations that we've been told about on the earth? I think that's the question she's asking. I'm not sure. Okay, I, this is totally outside my realm of expertise. I've mine too. Never, mine I too. Think most people on this planet are not even people. <laughs> and I'm a Brooklyn Jew, not in any way religious or Israeli or any more meaningful kind of Jew than that. Like I like bagels and matzo ball soup and arguing, and then that's about it. That's about as Jewish as I am, right? Um, so uh, okay, um, who started, who started the, health the health freedom movement? Um, let's that that's a good question. That is a good question. So my guess would be that there's probably like some original originators like back in the 60s or 70s or something like that when like spraying of crops first started that started like a natural food movement and it was probably pretty granola-y and pretty left wing, right? And then my guess would be that probably someone who had been part of the whole HIV AIDS uh, protesting against the, some of the things that were going on with that like that there's some people we should look at from that period of time. So, right. And then getting into the nineties, people started to have questions about pokeroonies because the frequency of autism and autoimmune conditions and stuff were rising. So there's probably some people around that. So, right. And, and then I, I think it's just increased as we've had like GMOs and they've started to try and crack down on natural health supplements sometime in the late 90s. So I think there's been like many um, places where something that could be called a health freedom movement. I think there's a different, I think there's like food freedom movements, health freedom movements, medical freedom movements that kind of fuse together over the course of the last several years. But I wonder if the people who were integral in those movements are are actually part of this current version. Cause I'm thinking of there was like the whole raw milk, raw dairy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, of course Sherry Tenpenny. Uh but I but they're not really the Bregan, the those people like the Bregans, Peter Bregan and right. Like those people have been around for a long time. Right. Like I mean I know Miriam was fighting for CBD stuff before this. I feel like this health freedom movement revolves primarily around the Pokeroonies. I mean, I think some of the people, who, but yes, I think these are the same people that like got on board around the time that Andrew Wakefield was going through his stuff around like 2011, 2012. That's yeah. the most modern iteration of it. And it's focused more around that than the other things. Cause I feel like, People think the other things still feel more voluntary rather than mandatory. You can choose to shop organic. You can choose to take medicine or not take medicine or whatever. Even but circumcision, I would I would put that in. That. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, for sure. And there's definitely been um, that's been a topic in the alternative media on and off for a long time at yep. varying levels. So I don't know. It would be an interesting thing to know. I wonder if there is like a 
historian. Yes, hi, higher heart wellness laughed at my bagels, matzo ball soup, matzo ball soup and arguing. Um, that's really, that. That those are the, I mean, I, I'm always exactly who I am. So um, uh, it would be interesting if there's like a person out there who's kind of like a historian of the health freedom movements that could, it, you know, not convince us who's right or wrong, but at least just tell us about where these things come from and yeah. who the main characters have been over time and how it has evolved and whether the people who started these things want anything to do with what is going on now or whether this has been like, you know, a racket from the beginning because it's definitely a racket now. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, Les Luthor in the house. Whee! Thor at the door. Chris Miner. Um, all right. Does anybody else have a question, a comment? It doesn't have to be relevant to what we talked about. Those like songs or favorite color questions and stuff like that. That's all fun too. I forgot when we were talking about favorite songs the other day, like I didn't even say any uh, queen songs and I love Freddie Mercury. I love, Ooh, I love fat bottom girls. I love fat bottom girl. I, they're so, I like so many of the songs and I like David Bowie songs too. And I like Prince songs. I forgot a lot of people. So um, yeah. It's hard to like make sure you cover the territory on the spot like that. Yeah. But if anyone wants to ask any of those types of questions just for shits and giggles before we hop off, now's your chance. Thor at the door says, for what it's worth, the Flower of Life book said the Jews were left over from the prior world and allowed to stay for this one. So do you mean uh, like the last part of the last root race before like, like, are we talking Atlantis? Are we talking Lemuria? I mean, I read this book last summer that said all of the lore around the Israelites and King Solomon and King David was stolen from the Egyptians and actually happened hundreds, if not thousands of years earlier, which for me erased my whole family history. So I think I, I think I, don't know. I think it's hard to get good information on this topic. And yeah. I think it this this extends into a talk about like the nature of reality and the metaphysics of, of this place that we actually live and what sound and light and all of this kind of stuff have to do with it and frequency bands. And, you know, I think there's so many layers to that cake, but I will say that like uh, geometry and architecture and angles do play into it. Cause he brought it up in reference to the flower of life. Yep. Right. That it does seem to me that there is a war on for sort of owning certain angles of, of reality or right kind of thing. And that th I think that this is really what's at the heart of uh, the conflicts in the Middle East is the different cultures relationships to geometry, to angles of perception. Um, and, and this is why certain locations are so important because the the way that the sun beats down on those and the sort of photonic reception that that one can have in certain areas comes with a lot of information right and i think that there's um i think that that that's probably what these sort of territorial disputes are like really over though most people who are fighting them don't know that like mm -hmm. they're 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 at, they're serving something else and they've been very very convinced um, I mean, I was looking at listening to a Glenn Greenwald video today where he had Jeremy Lafredo, who's a journalist at the Gray Zone on, showing a video he shot in Israel where he was like literally just like it's, went to this wall where they're blocking the food going into Gaza and talking to Israelis who were just like, no, kill them all. Like, it, you know, it, it was like gross, like literally like it was they, they were it was pretty gross. I don't get uh, that. It posted I, I, today on Glenn Greenwald. You can go check the check out the clip on Glenn Greenwald's channel. When you were just talking about the angles, I mm -hmm. saw in my mind's eye this thing which I had mentioned to you about the show The Curse that came out with Emma Stone that takes place in Española. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that she's currently in Truth or Consequences shooting another movie. I don't think any of that has to do with the, the movie she's making. I think it has to do with bringing her here yeah. and something happening in the land. And I think when you were saying angles, I'm like, oh, I huh? think that has something to do with it. I think New Mexico is like, I, New Mexico is occupies a unique place. It has a unique sort of, topo, like the, the makeup of the land is interesting. I don't know how familiar you are with like the idea that um, 
the like Egypt and all these like ancient lands that it's really the United States. Are you familiar with this concept? Yes, I have. Like Michael and I talked about it recent, a little bit recently on our uh, last project kids about this sort of interesting um, harmonic mountain in, in near Indianapolis and the moors that used to triangulate it every year at the same time. And is there sort of a hypercube harmonic portal inside of it that they were sort of working the energy that this is why they would sort of go around it at the same time every year, because you needed to be in a certain space in relationship with that mountain in order. And the, the people of that area did not like them. It was like the, um, the Ben, the Ben Israel tribe, I think is, I think it's right. Um, is that what it's called? Ben Ishmael, Ben Ishmael, Ben Ishmael tribe, Ben Ishmael, I think Ishmael or Israel, I forget, but they were Moors, right? Like it was, it was like the Moorish science kind of thing. Um, and then there's this idea that like Texas is Egypt and then that would make like another area, Morocco and another area here. And that this is like the new age. Ver I, I, I don't I'm not completely understanding the whole narrative, um, but I think this is what it has to do with is like you. I mean, we've all experienced this, right? Like you go someplace that feels completely different than where you came from and like what you're thinking about is totally different and how your body feels is totally different. And just like the way you're sort of dealing with reality is completely different. Even if you're just visiting there for a couple of days, like the way my body feels in Palm Springs compared to the way my body feels here is like night and day. Also the things I think about and the way I think about them. Right. And if you listen, go listen to like Bill Donahue. I can't remember if it's like 907 or 927 when he's talking about ang angels are really angels, uh, like photons, like photons, yeah. angles, right? Um, and he's talking about how we perceive the light coming in and the sort of uh, information and the sort of enlightenment and awareness that comes that comes with that. Like, I think that's what these locations are really about. Like, the people in the know know where to be, when to receive the message. Yeah, and I think, you know, I hung out with, uh, Jeff's friend, um, who has a background in the ritual sex slavery stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I got to grill her on a lot of it. And she was saying that, um, it was a great education for her because she saw that everything they were doing was with symbols and angles and geometry. And she learned like, oh, that's how, you know, that's true power. That's magic. Like that's how everything is done. Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, our home city, I don't think it's about angels, I think it's about angles. I, I don't know if it's the angles or lost angles, right? Um, but I think part of the reason Hollywood, like, there's the whole story with like the Hollywood and that's the trees that were growing there. And that has this magical metaphysical thing that allowed the entertainment industry to arise. But I think part of the reason it thrived there in a way that it's never thrived anywhere else is because there's so many angles of perception. There's so many ways to tell the same story. And yeah. there's so many realities coexisting in the same place. Like no other place that I go to parties, like when I'm having one of my experiences, do I see so many different things out of the corner of my eye, right? Like there's there's things existing at every sort of angle and level, right? Like there seems to be dimension after sub-dimension after sub-dimension accessible in the it, it, like right out in the open, but kind of if you're not going to notice it unless it unless you notice it type of thing, right? For some reason, this just occurred to me. I told you I'm reading the Fourth Reich, and I just read something about San Vicente, and it reminded mm -hmm. me of how in LA there are two San Vicentes, which is very confusing. Right, and one is this weird angle that cuts through because LA is pretty gridded. But one of those San Vicentes is like a diagonal line yep, yep, through yep. the grid. Um, well, one know. of them is like in Brentwood and one of them is like down by the Beverly Center. Correct. And I know exactly what you're talking about. And they're unrelated. Right. It's there. It, there this happens in most cities. Like here in Austin, there's two Duval roads and it gets pretty confusing for people. Um in the area of out, you know, outside of Los Angeles that my dad and his girlfriend live, there's two missions and they run opposite directions and they're like sort of surrounding the same area. And like, it's very easy to get confused and lost because there's literally like one mission running like this and one mission running like that. 
Correct. Right. And it's like, it, it's very confusing, but the San Vicente, th the way that San Vicente runs uh, diagonal through the area of the Beverly center is pretty weird. Um, but also remember That's also how where the new Cedars is. Yes. That's also they... remember how often we heard about San Vicente in the OJ Simpson. OJ, Yes, exactly. Right. Like they, it was, it was a main part of the sort of narrative. So, all right, we've gone extra long here. I'm going to give everybody one more chance to ask a question, make a comment. Oh, somebody did ask about records. When you asked about records, are you meaning like, okay, just music and songs again? Or are you talking about like records, like the kind of uh, record music that I like, like, like techno, like those kind of records? I don't know. I have a lot of favorite tracks. The only one that I can think of at this moment is Pontap by Renato Cullen. I, I doubt that any of you guys know it. I have many more. That's not the only one or even the most famous one, but that's just what popped to mind right now. But like, if I hear that on a dance floor, that gets me, that, that, that gets me all excited for sure. Um, okay. Fourth right. Someone's asking about your book. The department of the Mars. I'm reading the Mars one, but any references feral a lot. Yeah. All right. Somebody's having a DMT flashback during our show. That's excellent. Oh, I bet it's my background. <laughs> Laura meditates on um, a yantra that's ex the same as your background in the morning, right? Oh, to, right. In, like she'll meditate on it until it starts to spin and colors start popping off of it. And yes. It's <laughs> All right, guys. Um, we will be back next week. Uh, head on over to, if you love us, head on over to wordspodcast.locals.com, promo code, welcome to words, all capital in one one word, and become a supporter if you enjoy it, and uh, we'll see you back here next Wednesday. Bye. All done. Bye.